A very good evening, all of you. A warm welcome to this special webinar by our distinguished uh, Professor Dr. Amin Jahan Beglu. And I am extremely delighted on behalf of Jindal Global Law School and OP Jindal Global University uh, to have him uh, to speak about Gandhi. And it's a very special occasion in a way. Uh, uh, Dr. Amin, uh, who brought Gandhi uh, to Jindal Global University and Jindal Global Law School, because since the joining, uh, we had our first research center on Mahatma Gandhi uh, in our law school and university. And uh, uh, Professor uh, Ramin has a very distinguished uh, academic background. Uh, if I already shared his brief bio uh, in the invitation, but uh, very rarely you will find people who earn three master's degree in uh, philosophy, in political science, and uh, also a PhD uh, from different universities, and also a postdoctoral degree from the Harvard University where he also taught. Uh, I can see uh, over 20 years he has spent in the prestigious Sorbonne University and in uh, Paris in France. And he taught at the University of Toronto. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, and mostly I believe it was Gandhi and Gandhian philosophy of non-violence non uh, and peace, and uh, he even uh, received a United Nations Award, a Peace Prize also for his work. So a very, very distinguished individual, a professor, a scholar, and Gandhian uh, with us today. And uh, originally from uh, Tehran in Iran, but Professor Ramin has spent his uh, life around the world from uh, France to Canada uh, to, of course, India, and now last four years at Jindal Global Law School as our Vice Dean and uh, Professor, uh, as well as Executive Director of our Mahatma Gandhi Center. So over to you, sir. Thank you very much for this session. And uh, we will come back to you with all the questions of our attendees. So we'll encourage all of you to put your questions in the question box. And uh, after a brief lecture by uh, Professor Ramin, we will come back with a detailed question and answer session. And I wish that will be even more uh, interesting and uh, uh, a learning opportunity for all of us. So over to you, Professor Amin. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mishra. Uh, I say hello to uh, everyone, uh, students, faculty, everyone who is participating uh, on this online uh, lecture. I would like to express my gratitude to the Gender Law School, uh, all the people who have been making possible this uh, webinar uh, lectures. And uh, I would like to start uh, talking to you about uh, the Gandhian uh, vision of democracy. Now, when uh, this is a subject that is not treated very often, uh, we mostly talk about Gandhi as the father of the Indian nation and his role in the Indian independence and eventually his role in Indian politics, but not as a democratic theorist. And I think that people around the world are mostly familiar with the figure of Gandhi as a prophet of nonviolence, but few uh, recognize him as a democratic theorist. Uh, and well, I think that the Gandhian vision of democracy uh, is very relevant for our today's work, uh, but is still missing in most of the Western debates uh, on democratic theory, uh, Gandhi is not quoted very often uh, as a democratic theorist. 
but I think it is time now for uh, the comparative democratic theory to open up to uh, Gandhian philosophy, to the Gandhian legacy, I would say, of democratic thought. Especially uh, with what's happening in the world today, I think that the Gandhian democratic theory is uh, very relevant in a post-coronavirus world where we have, we will see more of it actually. We will have a crisis of democratic leadership. Uh, we will mostly have, I think, uh, a crisis of citizenry, uh, citizenry passions, uh, citizenry responsibility. Uh, that might be very natural to some of us because after a uh, pandemic, and usually after world wars, like World War I, World War II, you usually have this kind of crisis uh, because you have economic problems, social problems, political problems. So the citizenry might find also uh, a little bit, they lose their, uh, I would say, moral compass or political compass. And I believe that in a world where we're living in, a world which has become completely upside down by the coronavirus, and by the ongoing pandemic, uh, it shows that the democratic community seems uh, typically unprepared in some countries uh, to and jointly address the growing global challenges to democracy. So the question that I'm asking, and I think that Ghanaian usually answers to them, uh, and that's why he's very relevant. Uh, the first question uh, is the question of responsibility, how to mobilize responsibility. We have been doing it at the level of our university, but, uh, and uh, people have been trying to do it around the world. But uh, as you see, it's a very difficult task. Second question also, which is very important, is the question of solidarity. How can we strengthen solidarity? And the third question is how this Gandhian vision of democracy that I'm going to talk about can help us to correct the shortcomings of uh, neoliberalism uh, and I would say liberal democracies uh, around the world, including uh, Indian democracy. Uh, of course, I don't have the pretension uh, to answer all these questions in a 30 minutes talk, but I think that in the long run, uh, our world could try to answer all these questions uh, in relation to uh, Gandhi's uh, work. Uh, and here, I think that we can talk about Gandhian theory of democracy as and what I call integral democracy. And I will try to explain myself. Why do I call it an integral democracy? Because I think Gandhi is not only a theorist, as you know, he's also a practitioner of uh, politics and democracy. And uh, at the same time that he's criticizing liberalism, uh, he is accepting the fundamental ideas and values of uh, liberalism, for example, uh, in liberal thought, either classical or uh, more, uh, I would say, 20th century or 21st century liberal thought. We talk about all men have, uh, all human beings have equal rights. Uh, we talk about uh, the government should, be, uh, should function with the sanction of the people and especially the public opinion. Uh, we talk about accountability and we talk about everybody having the right to express his or her opinion uh, without encroaching on others' rights. These are uh, all the basics that I think that uh, either you as philosophers, political scientists, uh, lawyers, uh, law students, law professors, uh, most of you should know about this and you know about this because it starts with uh, John Locke and Montesquieu, and it goes up to Isaiah Berlin. Uh, so Gandhi has nothing against these precepts, I would say, and principles. Uh, he accepts, all, of course, all these uh, principles, but uh, so we should not term him as an opponent to liberalism. I think it would be wrong to say that, but he wants to, and that's where, why I call his theory an integral democracy. He wants to complete it. He wants to complete all these contributions uh, of Western or Indian uh, democratic theory. And of course, Gandhi's integral democracy uh, looks to many people uh, very utopian, and that's why they dismiss it most of the time by saying, well, it's utopian, we don't understand it. 
but I think that uh, in terms of uh, democratic thinking, uh, Gandhi is critique of several things which are important and it has been taken into consideration by some theorists around the world. One of them being that uh, for Gandhi, uh, democracy is not necessarily representative government, as you know. Uh, uh, we have to distinguish sometimes between uh, uh, democracy and also uh, liberal oligarchy. Uh, but even if we do not agree with the features of Gandhi's political thought, we do certainly appreciate his advocacy of citizenship duty, what I call the citizenship duty. Uh, I think uh, what of, of civism, which is very, very strong uh, in Gandhi and, in, and his insistence on ethical renewal of democracy in terms of character building. As you know, Gandhi always talks about nation building going hand in hand with character building. You cannot have leaders without having people of excellence and uh, with character building. I would say that since I'm talking to uh, professors and students and maybe some of the administrators of gender university also, uh, I think that a university without excellence and without character building is not, has no future either. So he, uh, Gandhi is insisting all the time on what he calls the enlightened citizenship or enlightened democracy, which uh, I think in particularly in our post-coronavirus world, uh, which is suffering from democratic passion uh, and with, as I said, the problems of responsible citizenry, I think it's gonna be very, very important to understand. But there is, uh, I think, another aspect which remains at the heart of the Gandhian idea of a social and political organization. And that's where Gandhi, uh, and we have very few Western theorists at this level, where he is trying to uh, find, a, 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 I would say, a, a solution to the tension, which is to the modern tension mostly, which exists between spirituality and politics. There is no tension for Gandhi between spirituality and politics, but it is, there is a tension for secular politics, uh, for secular republicanism, for example, like uh, in case of France, uh, we can say, uh, in modernity. Uh, why there is no tension? Because Gandhi, first of all, he's not a, a religious fanatic. He is not a populist. Uh, and he thinks that spirituality and politics can go hand in hand. And from his point of view, uh, there would always be a need for spiritual intervention in the domain of the political. So the Gandhian principle of spiritualization of the political, and that's his own words actually, can be regarded as a form of interconnecting the political to the ethical. And I think that's that it goes to the, uh, the, it's at the heart of Gandhi's theory of democracy, because when Gandhi is talking about political leadership, democratic leadership, he understands by that ethical leadership, moral leadership. Uh, and this is one of the crises that we have in today's world. We do not have many moral leaders left around the world. Uh, I would say Mandela and Havel uh, were the last ones maybe in, in the 20th century or early 21st century. So Gandhi's political leadership is very different uh, from other forms of leadership. Why? Because his political philosophy was not born of any prevalent political stream and his political philosophy was not made of immutable principles. That's the difference between Gandhi and uh, the liberals. Uh, uh, his theory actually was evolving through his own experiments, what he calls my ex his experiments with truth, but I would call it also his experiments with politics. Uh, and uh, he based it, his experience mostly on the grievances of peoples and nations around the world. So this experiential aspect in comparison with the cognitive one, because Gandhi's approach to politics is not necessarily cognitive all the time. Uh, though he's a, I, I consider him as a theorist, it's very experimental. And that's where the ethics comes in and where he believes in the basic human goodness. Uh, he anthropologically, we can say he's an optimist. He is not a pessimist. 
he's not like Machiavelli, he's not like Nietzsche, he's not like Schopenhauer, uh, he's not like all those thinkers and philosophers who uh, are anthropologically pessimist, pessimistic about uh, the, the evil in uh, human nature. Uh, for Gandhi, there is no evil in human nature. But he's a moral, uh, he called himself uh, a, pra a practical idealist. Uh, more, uh, he has a, a moral idealism, and he bases that on his integrity philosophy uh, of life. So as such, uh, again, he applies his experiments with life into his experiments with, with uh, democracy, and he brings all these experiments uh, in life uh, as we see it in his uh, autobiography, as we see it in Hindu Swaraj, uh, he brings all this in the process of thinking politics, thinking political action, thinking political praxis, thinking political theory. Uh, and uh, what is important for him? How does he define politics? Well, he defines politics in a very different way than somebody like Machiavelli, Hobbes, Rousseau, and uh, the classical thinkers of politics that we know. For Gandhi, politics is the art of organizing the society. I would say, in that sense, he is very close to the Greeks, ancient Greeks. It's the art, but it's the nonviolent art of organizing the society. You cannot organize it in, in a violent manner. So, this, the nonviolent political sphere is neither based on the principle of laissez faire, as in uh, liberalism, nor on the separation between the private and the public. And I think this is very, very important. Uh, very rarely I see any articles or any books referring to the fact that for Gandhi, in the same manner as for the Athenians in fifth century before Christ, uh, in their democracy, there is no separation between public and private. Maybe that's one of the reasons why he has so many problems in his own private life, in his own family, with his own children, because Everything for Gandhi was public, actually. Uh, even his relationship with his sons, actually, was uh, very, very public. So he does not see modern individual as an economic agent with wants and rights. He repeats that many, many times. Uh, this individual for him he has also duties and responsibilities. And I would say that for Gandhi, duties and responsibilities are even more important than wants and rights. And it's exactly the opposite that what we have in today's world, where wants and rights are more important for individuals than uh, necessarily uh, duties. So here I would add, I would bring in, uh, and I have the, actually talked about it in many of my books on, on Gandhi and Gandhism. I bring in another concept, which is very closely related to Gandhian idea of democracy, and that's the, the, the concept of shared sovereignty uh, in opposition to liberal or any other form or authoritarian oligarchy. For Gandhi, democracy is a shared sovereignty. This is how he defines Swara. This is where he talks about self rule This is where he talks about transformation of society. This is where he talks about enlightened democracy, all the different notions that he uses, shared sovereignty. Uh, Panchayat Raj is shared sovereignty. Uh, shared sovereignty is because, um, and this is very, very modern, I think, Gandhi actually, when he talks about Swaraj, and he says Swaraj is not only Indian independence, but it's about self-rule, self-restraint, self-discipline. Uh, is actually he's talking about the self-institution of the society where the duty and responsibility of the citizens are the crucial yardsticks not necessarily the representatives of the people because he doesn't really believe in representative government in the way that somebody like Nehru believes in but citizens are the crucial yardsticks so it's this form of self-institution is also a transformative theory because for Gandhi, democracy is not solely a political problem, as I said. It's also a problem, an ethical problem, a problem of fairness, a problem of uh, equality. And so uh, that's why the problem, uh, I mean, Gandhi next to Ambedkar, it's somebody who is very, very concerned 
during the independence program of India with the inequalities. Uh, untouchability being one of the issues actually, but there is also the issue of women. So since I'm talking to some lawyers, Gandhi is certainly not a constitutional lawyer when it happened, when we're talking about his democratic theory. He is not trying to preserve only democratic institutions. Yeah? Like somebody like Nehru might do that. He is trying to practice democracy. The practice, the practice of democracy is much more important for him than the preservation. When we talk about the constitution, we're talking about the principles and we're talking about the preservation uh, of, of liberalism. Uh, so in Gandhi's mind, uh, the idea of the constitution is the idea of the self-rule of a nation. How can, they, how can people self-rule themselves? How do they uh, constitute a self-made institution? And this, I think, is very, very interesting because in many debates that today is happening in the, at the level of political philosophy in the Western world, you have people who are already talking about this. And actually, Gandhi talked about it maybe something like 18, 18 19 years ago. Uh, this is why I think Gandhi is not only a demo democratic theorist, but he's also a dissenter and because he is uh, very much deceived and disappointed by the utilitarian uh, philosophy, uh, actually through his readings of Ruskin and Thoreau and Tolstoy, uh, but also he's very much uh, against the individualistic tendencies of uh, democracy. Uh, or let's call it uh, liberal uh, world. So all these uh, uh, help us to understand Gandhi that he, he can be a very important thinker for today's uh, when we're talking about democracy being uh, menaced by populism, by the culture of passivity, by the culture of conformity, by complacency. In most of the uh, Gandhi's writing speeches, actions, you see that he goes against any form of conformism, any form of complacency, any form of uh, conservatism. Uh, and that's why he tries to uh, dis persuade his fellow Indians to concentrate their energies on the resurgence of uh, some of the values which are uh, democratic uh, uh, values. Now, uh, I think that uh, one of the aspects which are very important in Gandhian thought, uh, especially Gandhian theory of democracy, is that Gandhi is also very much against uh, bureaucratization of politics and also against centralization of politics. In many of his uh, letters, in many of his writings, if you go and uh, you take a look at the 100 volumes, you see that he is referring to, uh, he's, he's actually referring to a critique of centralized power. He has always been against, uh, even at the level of the Congress Party, and that's one of the reasons why after the independence he leaves the Congress Party, because he's, uh, he's not a very man, he's not really, when it comes to democratic theory, he's not really a man or a man of politics. Uh, so there is a critique of governmentality, I can say, in these terms, uh, as a crucial pillar to uh, Gandhi's uh, theory of democracy. and. This is where I think that Gandhi differs from all the um, uh, fundamentals, all the founders of uh, modern politics in the Western world, people like Machiavelli, Hobbes, Rousseau, and many others, especially because uh, the problem in all these thinkers that I mentioned, the violence is a big problem in the, in the making of, the modern, of modern politics, in the making of social order, you, there is always a reference to one kind of, uh, I would say, violence. Now, this, uh, what I would call the Hobbesian impulse of self-preservation in, in modern politics, this doesn't exist, as you know, in Gandhi. In Gandhi, we have the idea of self-sacrifice, which we find later on in somebody like uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, you need to participate to have empathy, you need to have empathy for the suffering of others. You need to, be, uh, to pay attention to the, what I call the otherness of the other. And this is the basic of nonviolence in some people like uh, Gandhi and uh, Martin Luther King. 
how to be empathetic. I mean, I think this is the most important thing that we need today uh, in the post-coronavirus uh, world. And without that, we cannot have uh, a solidarity. So the Hobbesian idea of Commonwealth and Rousseau's concept of general will uh, are as indivisible political community. Uh, this doesn't exist in Gandhi, uh, in Gandhi's theory of, uh, of democracy. What, what uh, Gandhi actually replaces it with this idea that I call shared sovereignty. And this is obtained through a self-reliant, self-ruled uh, community. And I will under underline uh, three times self-ruled community. Uh, because when he's talking about Panchayat Raj and when he's talking about the village republics, he's always believing that, well, uh, peasants themselves, people put trusteeships, they have to self-rule and to self-institute uh, their uh, community. So there is no pyramid of power in Gandhi. What, what we see in his democratic theory is that we don't have top uh, down uh, line of thought. We have a bottom up actually uh, practice. And here democracy is defined by, Gandhi, by somebody like Gandhi as self-realization of individuals self-realization of individuals. Uh, that is to say, in Gandhi's theory of democracy, citizens are supposed to be self-conscious and self-transformative. And again, I will underline self-transformative because I think that's also very, very important. Now, look at how relevant this is because today in many uh, aspects of the uh, uh, political theory in this, especially in the Western world, we talk about autonomy and heteronomy. And Gandhi, actually, when he refers to the concept of Swaraj, uh, he says Swaraj, before being the independence, uh, it's about ruling oneself, self-governance, knowing how to rule oneself ethically, morally, and then self-governance at the political level. So self-rule should influence not only the inner life of the individual for Gandhi, but also his or her public life uh, in a nation, I would say, which is very important, which brings with it uh, responsibilities and obligations. And uh, this is where I, again, I think that uh, uh, it's like uh, in, in Kantian terms, if I have to put it in a modern philosophy, philosophical terms, it's like being a member of the kingdom of ends. This is what Kant actually, a, a philosopher like Immanuel Kant talks about, uh, taking the other person as an end and not as a means. So who is the autonomous individual for Gandhi? He actually refers to Socrates. And again, very interesting, many people think that Gandhi is not a reader of Western philosophy, but actually he is. And he uh, portrays uh, Socrates as a great Satyagrahi, as somebody who uh, is uh, committed to frankness or the Greek idea of Theresia, and who has the courage of dying. And you know, all these aspects are so important for Gandhi because he talks about himself and the courage of dying. He, uh, such, being a Satyagraha is so, so important, self-discipline is so important. But I'm, I'm putting all these in the context of democratic theory. I mean, I'm taking them out of the ethics or ethical philosophy and, and bringing them to a democratic theory as Gandhi does, does himself. And why does Gandhi actually is, take, uh, is embracing all these principles? Because Gandhi wants to make a critique of utilitarian philosophy, and especially the two mottos, as you know, of modernity, which are still making problem for us, might is right and survival of the fittest. So his political philosophy are not based on these two main, uh, especially Western, I would say, notions. Uh, so what is the, what remains? And let me uh, conclude uh, on that, uh, I would say. Well, I think that, uh, the Gandhi's Gandhian conception of uh, democracy uh, becomes very relevant to uh, contemporary political theory. Uh, why? Because, as I said, not only Gandhi tries to uh, correct the shortcomings 
of communitarianism and uh, shortcomings of liberalism. Uh, as you know, Gandhi does not support either communism or uh, capitalism. He is critique of both of them. Uh, but the two notions which are so important in today's world, and I've been working on that more and more, uh, which are at the heart of Gandhi's democratic theory are the notions of disobedience and dissent. Uh, as I said previously, Gandhi, uh, you know, I have a book by the title of the Indian uh, Disobedient Indian. I think Gandhi is a disobedient Indian, but Gandhi is also a dissenter. He's a dissident in the same sense that we use it in, uh, in, in, in ethics or I would say in politics. Uh, why? Because uh, Gandhi does not, in a very modern way, as the modern theorists have been doing it, especially in the liberal thought, is he does not define our liberties as only negative liberties, but also as positive liberties, meaning that we are not only people who are concerned, as Benjamin Constant says, uh, the French uh, theorists of the 19th century, that only having pleasure in private sphere is important for the citizens and we leave the agora and the public sphere to the representatives of the people. This doesn't work for somebody like Gandhi. Uh, and in that sense, uh, Gandhi is very close to somebody like Hannah Arendt. Gandhi is very close to somebody like Cornelius Castoria. Uh, Gandhi is very close to uh, Claude Lefort, uh, Chantal Mouffe. Many of the theorists uh, of 20th century or, uh, yes, mostly 20th century theorists um, with whom I actually I studied and uh, actually I was very much influenced by their theories. Uh, so um, it's important that uh, I, I find the Gandhi this civic citizenship and the concept that you have to practice democracy if you want to, to uh, preserve it. So, uh, uh, last but not least, I think we should not forget that for Gandhi, pluralism without responsibility is a contradiction in terms. And today we talk about pluralism, but responsibility is not there, especially civic responsibility. And we can refer uh, to a letter that uh, I will finish by this letter of Gandhi, which he wrote in 1910 to Magalhaes Gandhi. And he says in this letter, which is a, a very interesting letter, uh, more than 100 years ago, actually, uh, please do not carry unnecessarily on your head the burden of emancipating India. Emancipate your own self. Even that burden is very great. Apply everything to yourself nobility of soul consists in realizing that you are yourself India. In your emancipation is the emancipation of India. Thank you very much. So thank you, Professor. Uh, we have some interesting questions which have come up. And uh, I will thank the audience, particularly those who ask these questions. So the very first question I would like to take is uh, from Tamogna Chattopadhyay. Tamogna asks, actually she has asked two questions. And uh, one is about, uh, she asked about Gandhi's ethical democracy and its alignment to Aristotle's philosophical king. So she asked, does Gandhi, one ethical democracy, aligns to Aristotle's philosoph philosophical king? And uh, she also adds, uh, she wants to say it's Plato's philosophic, philosopher king and not uh, Aristotle's. So, 
basically gandhi on ethical democracy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, plato's philosophical philosopher came what she wants a uh, response of yours should i respond uh thank you very much for this uh, interesting question uh you know most of the when you, you go back again to the 100 volumes of uh, Gandhi's writings uh, letters and other things uh, there is uh, mostly as you know reference to plato more than aristotle <coughs> actually gandhi even translated uh, the apology of plato where you have uh, this uh, scene of uh, trial socrates's trial so he was because not not mainly because he was interested in Plato because he was interested in Socrates. I would say that uh, the, the, his hero in Greek philosophy uh, uh, are nigh his heroes. Uh, his hero is Socrates, uh, not neither uh, Plato or Aristotle. But uh, essentially, there are two points uh, very brief. One is that. Um, Gandhi certainly does not accept this tradition, this Platonic uh, uh, tradition of philosophy scheme, that because it's very authoritarian, uh, and he never refers to it as uh, as an important uh, theory, uh, though he talks about Plato and he talks about Plato. Now, Aristotle. Uh, I'm not sure that Gandhi actually read Aristotle. There is not much of a reference uh, to Aristotle. And, but we can make comparisons, uh, nevertheless, uh, despite the fact that he has not read Aristotle, because there, is, uh, there are one or two notions in Aristotle's ethics and politics, which I, we can find in Gandhi. And one of them is civic friendship. You know, the Greeks, they talk very often about civic friendship, and they think that civic friendship is very, especially Aristotle is very fond of this notion, because uh, he thinks that, uh, again, uh, this has to be the basis of the polypolis or the city state, the Athenian city state. And here, uh, what interests Gandhi, which I did talk about, is the, the duty of the citizens. As you know, Aristotle actually underlines good citizenship, he talks about good citizenship. He said, you cannot be a good person without being a good citizen. He makes an equivalence between being a good person and being a good citizen. Because the end for Aristotle in his politics and in his ethics is political at the end of the term. Because we are actually zone political, as he says, we are political animals. We are actually animals who self-institute self the society to live politically or meaning to organize it. And I think that Gandhi is very, very close to this notion, uh, despite the fact that he's not uh, Athenian at all. So a lot of questions have come up and some very fundamental questions also. Like uh, Swati has asked a question. Uh, in your view, what kind of government uh, Mahatma Gandhi wanted for India. So, the present government, uh, do you think this was what uh, Gandhi wanted? Yes, uh, well, the, the answer to this question is very easy because Gandhi has written on it uh, very openly, very transparently, very clearly. Uh, he talks about uh, he actually uses two notions. One is Panchayat Raj, as you know, uh, the, the village republic, uh, and decentralized uh, republic, not representative government. And the second one is actually Rama Rajya, uh, which he talks about uh, in 1945, and uh, especially in an article that he writes in the Hindu in, uh, on June 22, 1945. Uh, he says that Rama Raja is the perfect democracy for him. Uh, why? Because uh, there are no inequalities. And he mentions the inequalities, which are stay, still with us. I mean, these inequalities are here in Indian society and in Western society. Gandhi talks about uh, inequalities are based on possession, 
based on color, based on race, based on creed, based on sex. And he says in his Ramaraja, there should not be these inequalities. And, and he says, uh, but let me add to it. I, I know that as lawyers, most of you would say it has complications because Gandhi would say uh, the state actually belongs to the people. Uh, so this is actually, I think, uh, where we can say that his integral philosophy is a direct democracy. What um, a, a form of democracy that was practiced mostly by the Athenians and later on uh, in modern times in some parts of Switzerland and in maybe American Revolution and French Revolution, according to Anna Arendt and others, in some uh, moments of these revolutions, you had moments of the direct democracy with uh, consul democracy and others. Uh, Gandhi is very close to that. So he's in, he certainly that this is where he would uh, criticize, uh, uh, first of all, he criticized the modern state. Secondly, so we can consider him as a theorist who, who was against the modern state. Secondly, he asked for the responsibility of the citizens. And thirdly, he wants to make it as ethical as possible. And because for him, the pure political is not enough. There has to be more of it. So I have two questions from uh, Mr. Deepu Krishna. And uh, interesting questions. Uh, one he asks about Arundhati Roy, the famous author, being very critical of Gandhi, and she preferred Ambedkar over Gandhi in her writings. She was critical of uh, Gandhi's take on casteism. Yes. I think Professor Anand is cut. Okay, Professor, I'll continue the question. The question is, uh, Arundhati Rai has been very critical of uh, Gandhi and she preferred Ambedkar over him. She was critical of his take on uh, Kaftism. What is your opinion about it? Well, I've written about this, you know, because um, I just uh, finished a book uh, which is partly on Ambedkar. So um, I think that um, what Arundhati Roy says is partly fair and partly unfair uh, to Gandhi, because Gandhi, in his debate with Ambedkar, he was very uh, aware, I would say, very, very much, much aware of Ambedkar's uh, grievances and Ambedkar, what Ambedkar was, was uh, suggesting. The only thing which, I, I mean, I think, for example, uh, when he was talking about untouchability or inequalities, Gandhi, I think, uh, when he answers Ambedkar, he agrees with Ambedkar that these problems exist. The only problem that, uh, I think that uh, Arundhati Roy uh, tries to be on the side of Ambedkar, and I'm not necessarily trying to defend Gandhi uh, against Ambedkar because I also believe that Ambedkar is a, is an interesting and important theorist, and he's fighting for democracy also at the same level. The only problem is spirituality. Uh, you know, it's so difficult for somebody like Gandhi to uh, abandon spirituality and especially abandon Hinduism. I would say spiritual Hinduism, because as you know, he's against uh, Hindutva, he's against Sabarkar, he's against uh, fanatic Hinduism. Uh, he would have been against populist Hinduism. But uh, Gandhi in general, he compares Hinduism to his wife. Uh, this is one of the, his quotes, meaning that he's very close to Hinduism. So, and uh, in Ambedkar, we have the exit from Brahmanism and from Hinduism and uh, turning towards Buddhism. Uh, for Gandhi, we don't have that actually. And I think that, that, that that's the main thing uh, which uh, Arundhati Roy 
doesn't agree or doesn't accept in Gandhi that Gandhi remains uh, faithful and loyal to uh, spirituality in general and also uh, to uh, at some point I would say to Hinduism uh, more than Ambedkar who is typical a secular a secular figure. And Gandhi is not a typical secular figure. We have another question from Vika Sudhakaran Sunu. Uh, she's asking you how effective would Gandhian democracy be in a country with so many different kinds of cultures and languages? Do you think if we live in a Gandhian democracy, it would help reduce communal riots? Oh, yes. I think that uh, the importance of Gandhi is because of the diversity, actually. When Gandhi is talking about integral democracy, uh, he is taking into consideration uh, cultural pluralism, ethnic pluralism. Uh, you, uh, I think that most of the people who are listening to me, uh, they remember this quote of Gandhi when he's talking about his house and the windows of his house being open to other cultures and the winds of other cultures going through his house. It means that Gandhi is essentially somebody who is very open-minded towards other cultures and ethnics and other uh, groups, I would say. Uh, so it's, it certainly uh, is, is possible. Now, I have to, there has to be an ad additional point here, which helps you to understand. Uh, if today we read Gandhi, if today we even practice Gandhism or we practice nonviolence, is because we believe in correcting the shortcomings of our political agenda. If you see it from this angle, which I actually live and practice my uh, political, uh, I would say, uh, convictions all around the world, not only in India and Iran or elsewhere or Canada, but all around the world, is that we are not, well, we are very aware of that, we are not living in perfect political constructions and structures. So we need that they have a lot of shortcomings. And sometimes these shortcomings, like in the time of coronavirus and pandemics and world wars and problems and crises, these shortcomings actually come to the surface. So we have to turn towards theorists and Gandhi being one of them who help us with it to correct these shortcomings. And I think Gandhian democratic theory has very important strong points to help us uh, to go over, uh, to come over uh, these shortcomings. Great, sir. So the next question is from uh, Srabya Vemuri. He's asking, uh, can one say that Marx and Gandhi were intellectual partners in their critique of Western civilization? Yet, how are they different in terms of their ideas on unalienated life? No, but who says that Marx is a critic of Western civilization? Marx is not a critic of Western civilization. He's a critic of capitalism. Uh, and, uh, and actually Marx uh, accepts uh, many of the precepts and principles of Western political theory, one of them being the state. Uh, when he's talking about communism or socialism, he, he thinks in terms of the socialist state. That's the difference between Gandhi and Marx. Gandhi is very close to somebody like Tolstoy or Henry David Thoreau. He believes, and actually he quotes Henry David Thoreau on that. He believes in minimum government. He believes in minimum state not in the sense that American libertarians, some of them believe today. Uh, it's not exactly the same philosophy, but it, it, because Gandhi thinks that uh, politics is not Hobbesian Commonwealth or uh, Rousseau's social contract. Uh, so he, when, he's starting he, when he starts to define uh, politics and uh, bringing ethics into politics, for him, uh, the state, the institution of the state is not in the middle of it. And I would say that the, 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 the compass is not the state. So the citizens are interrelated in their own work and the state is completely separated from them. I think that this is where Gandhi becomes very critical of the centralization of the state, the bureaucratization of the state, and the fact that uh, even political parties, that they get separated from the people and they cannot be controlled anymore. And we have this danger of, uh, of, of authoritarianism of, uh, uh, and uh, other forms, actually. So 
there is, I think, a lot of difference with Marx. And in Gandhi, I don't see really an ideology as, and some points uh, we have it with Marx in uh, Mar Com Communist Manifesto and some of the pamphlets writings of Marx, not in, in Das Kapital or in uh, Grundrisse, but in um, some of the, I would say, uh, pamphlets, uh, uh, historical pamphlets that were write, written by Marx. Uh, they are much more ideologic, ideologically based than uh, Marx, uh, the theorist. Uh, so Gandhi is not really an ideologist like Marx. Okay, the oh. next question, um, Sai Patil, and uh, she's saying us, Mr. Gandhi himself says, true fruit in life is the achievement of right. So what rights did he have in his government? What happens with the government? Yeah, no, she's asking true, uh, as in she's quoting a quote from uh, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. She says, Mr. Gandhi himself says, true fruit in life is the achievement of right. So the question is, okay. so rights did women have in his go government? Okay, uh, yes, once again, uh, uh, as I said, uh, when Gandhi is talking about truth, he does not have a cognitive approach, but his approach is very existential and experimental, as you know. And this is how he explains it in his autobiography, more mainly in his autobiography, but also in Him Swaraj, if you have not read it. Uh, so since it's, it's experimental, it can change all the time, it's self-transformative. And this is where I think that uh, for Gandhi, uh, citizens, either women or men, uh, they play a very important role in their own organization of self-organization of the society, in their own experiments with truth, in their own experiments with politics. Because he says uh, we have as many experiments with truth as we have individuals around the world. Uh, and they can approach truth in their own manners, but uh, we need each other to complete this because we each have different visions of this truth. And that's why we should be tolerant, uh, or let's say we need to have this pluralism uh, of value, value pluralism. I, I think that is the best word that we can use for Gandhi also. Uh, we, need, we, this, we need this value pluralism because otherwise we cannot be in dialogue with each other. And we become fanatics and we actually try to negate each other. Uh, if we want to be in a the democracy and we have to have this balance we need to have this value pluralism and this value pluralism is based on the diversity of truths on the on the on the on, on, on the fact that we each have this different experience of life great sir great so the next question is from shruti dahia and she's asking how far theory of self-realization helps when people are in need of basic necessities such as food and employment, as we have seen when the nation moved from subjugation to an independent one. Yeah, you know, uh, you self-realize yourself also by eating. Uh, because I don't think that we need to put uh, one against each other, actually they complete each other. Uh, again, uh, self-conservation uh, is both mental and is physical. Uh, and Gandhi was very aware of this, uh, the fact that uh, you need to feed the people, but at the, at the same time, you need to feed them spiritually, uh, mentally, intellectually. Uh, what's the point of people being fed and uh, having um, you know, big stomachs, but having small brains uh, and not being able to think about their destiny? That's what actually the populist governments suggest. They said, well, we're gonna feed you, but we are not gonna feed you intellectually and we keep you uh, like sheep or we keep you uh, with brainwash and uh, we don't want you to interfere in the works of the state. Now for somebody like Gandhi, and you can go and find what I'm talking about, I'm not making it up. Uh, he actually is, was very much aware of the fact that people should have this self-preservation, of course, this self uh, at the level of uh, their wants, uh, 
But at the same time, they need to have an intellectual uh, level of understanding of how they have to organize their lives on the planet, in the world, but also in a society. And I think this is very, very important because in today's world, uh, we can see where the shortcomings come from. In today's world, we, the, the, the climate change and the problems that we have with the planet, uh, global warming and everything, has to do with the fact that people have become consumers. So they know about their wants, they know about their rights, they can feed themselves, or they can talk about feeding the peasants and feed the poor, but they don't talk about the intellectual side of it, that the fact that how we should be also ready as every human being on this planet to uh, fight for the survival of the planet, to fight for the survival of animals and plants, and to change uh, our modality of wants and but our duties. And this is where Gandhi comes in because he says we need to change that. It's not only the act, the, the act of eating uh, and consuming, which helps us to, uh, to, to continue life. Life is also moral growth, moral growth. And if we don't have this moral growth, we cannot go forward actually in our democratic uh, realization. Okay. So now we have a very interesting question from uh, Muhammad uh, Minhajuddin. It's a very interesting question, sir, in the current scenario also. He is uh, asking you, we have constitutional provision related to panchayat to ensure local democracy. Still, we see huge crisis in villages. Nobody wants to live there. We have migrant crisis now. Can we say local democracy is still effective? No, local democracy is not effective. Uh, we know that. Every, everyone knows. Uh, uh, we do not have, even at the level of uh, federal states around the world, uh, like India, Switzerland, the United States of America, and some others, uh, where you don't have uh, this authoritarian centralization of power, but there are actually temptations of having this centralization to one political party, to one uh, government. And uh, you see all the problems that we have around the world that, that's, uh, that shows that there the, the are a lot of shortcomings. And I don't think that the, what Gandhi had in mind, which was again the idea, first of all, uh, it, it was the idea of self-institution of the society. It was the idea of self-rule. It was the idea of being autonomous. And it was the idea that people, uh, both uh, internally, individually, but at the level of a nation and a people, they know why they are living together and why they are making laws and they have a government. Today, the problem in practically all over the world, I would say, practically all over the world, is self-alienation self-alienation people are completely alienated from politics they don't know about politics they are not interested in politics and so the politicians rule them political parties rule them so True. what somebody like Gandhi is asking is bring us our consciousness try to bring consciousness and politics together try to make ourselves responsible and this is the first step in making this self-transformation -trans in the democratic world I think that we don't have time anymore. <laughs> yeah, we have as last two questions if you allow, sir. Okay, sure. Yeah. So there is a I guess we have a fan of Dominic Lapier here. He might have read Freedom at Midnight. So naturally this question is coming from there. Uh, he is asking you, there is a common perception that if Jinnah would have been the first PM, then we could have prevented partition. But though Gandhi is very critical of every fact and had made bold statements. Do you think in this matter of power struggle, he was kind of biased towards Nehru and doesn't it con itself contradicts that Gandhi has preached for years? No, you know, when it comes to partition, I think that uh, Indians uh, and Pakistanis at some point, they have to uh, get uh, peace in their souls. 
and they have not, after several generations, they do not have this peace in mind yet. Why? Because they are still looking for guilty people, either Jinnah or Gandhi or Nehru or Patel or somebody and somebody, it, depending on your political party, depending if you're a Muslim or a Hindu, uh, depending on your, if you're Indian or Pakistani, it has nothing to do with that. I think uh, there, there were shortcomings on every side. And there were people who were already conscious about that and they were trying to somehow prevent partition. I think the roots, you know, I've, uh, if you go and uh, look in my articles and books, I've written on Gandhi and the Khilafat. It's when Gandhi comes back to India uh, and he starts working with the Khilafat movement, which as you know, the Ali brothers and uh, the, and many others. And this is where he gets to know Molana Azad and Abdul Bakar Khan. And so it's very important to have what was the Gandhi's contact with the, the Muslims. He tried to understand them. You know, he tries. He tried to understand them uh, when he was a kid. Uh, when he went to South Africa, he worked with Muslims, and then when he came back to India in 1915, in 1919, he started to work with Muslims again. Uh, in the Khilafat movement. But already in the Khilafat movement, you have the roots of the partition, because the Khilafat movement actually stops at some point, and Gandhi is unable. To, uh, with the exception of Abdul Rafa Khan and the Mullah Azad who stay with him until the end. He, is, he has problems actually to bring the Muslim League on his side. Uh, and these are because there are very, uh, I think, uh, deep roots uh, for this uh, communal uh, feud and communal quarrel and disharmony. And Gandhi was very, very aware of that. But it was difficult to prevent it, especially because the British didn't help at all. And we know that there has been many levels at, uh, at the level of uh, the Hindu, uh, Hindu Dva, uh, Muslim League, and the British, and of course, uh, people who were engaged in the independence movement and the Congress Party also, they, they didn't do exactly what they had to do. Uh, Brilliant. Professor, so I think we are up and at the end of the session. It's Thank already said. Thank you, I, for you for sparing time and you know really blessing us with your presence and also blessing all the you know um, the, the attendees with your knowledge and knowledge is something which again Gandhiji said it just increases with when you share and we are so thankful to you for sparing your time and you know coming here Thank you. we are thankful okay. to the attendees also we are thankful to all the questions which were asked and believe me this was really a, 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 a few hours of our life which we really felt like you know Gandhiji was somewhere around. You know. So thank you so much, sir. And thank you to all the attendees. And uh, stay in touch, people. We are, you know, hosting more faculties of ours. We'll be coming and enlightening you. So there are questions relating to our admission policy. Uh, you know, what you could do is uh, you can go and visit our page. We're always available on the WhatsApp also for any admission related queries. You can contact us separately. So I did not take up admission related questions here because this was purely an academic lecture. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank so you good night. Much. Good night to each one of you. Bye. Thank you. Good afternoon. How do I get out of this? Okay.